All right. So, I made the decision early this morning to preempt the teaching in Ephesians. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we are uh, currently going through this epistle uh, to the church in Ephesus, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But uh, I sense that the Lord would have us to devote the entirety of our time today to the Middle East prophecy update, which we usually do after the teaching in Ephesians. So today we're going to do it instead of <laughs> uh, the teaching in Ephesians. And this for a number of reasons, chief of which is that I woke up a little after 3 a.m. this morning, as I usually do on Sunday mornings. I try to go to bed early on Saturday nights, uh, and uh, last night I was able to do that. So I get up early, and then uh, I wake up to a text from a friend and online member, Kelly McGuire, who works at Fox News in New York, and she was apprising me of the breaking news of this Syrian uh, chemical weapons attack near Damascus. And um, I decided then at that point to uh, forego Ephesians and uh, talk uh, very candidly today about the significance of this. And I, I want to preface it by saying that, uh, and I, I think you know this about me, at least I hope you do, I'm always very careful not to come off as being, you know, sensational or even provocative. And uh, I try to keep, um, <laughs> I try to stay calm. I was going to say that, but that doesn't, that's not really true. I'm not very a very calm person. Um, but I, I just want to uh, say that in light of everything that has happened and even now is happening, uh, this is truly, in every sense of the word, a game changer. And that's almost, in a way, an understatement of sorts. I'm going to ask that you bear with me. I'm going to try as best as I can to sort through all of this. I actually spent about eight hours yesterday prior to uh, this chemical attack, just on the prophecy update, just by sure virtue of how much has happened just in the last few days, just this last week. So what I want to do is argue the case that we are witnessing three specific prophecies. You see them there on the screen. We talk about them, it seems now, on a weekly basis, and for good reason. But I want to argue that we are witnessing these three specific prophecies beginning to come to pass very quickly. And I use that word uh, for a reason. This is what Jesus said twice, actually, in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. He said two times, behold, I come quickly. Now, we know that this word in the original language of the Greek New Testament is the Greek word tachos, where we get our English word for tachometer. And the reason I mention that again today is because what Jesus was saying is, behold, I come at a time when things are revving up. Things are speeding up. Things are happening more and more quickly. I, that's probably not a proper English sentence structure, but uh, it is happening with increasing intensity and even increasing frequency. So what I want to do is uh, focus in on these three prophecies, starting with Isaiah 17.1 which is a prophecy about Damascus, Syria, being so totally destroyed that it becomes uninhabitable. Very specific prophecy in verse 1 of Isaiah 17. There's also a prof prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 49 uh, concerning Damascus, Syria as well. 
Uh, the second prophecy is a well-known one in Ezekiel 38, and this is a prophecy about an alliance of nations that launches an attack against Israel for the purpose of taking a spoil which implies that at the time of the attack, Israel will be very prosperous. And we see that certainly today. Now, who is at the helm of this alliance of nations? It's none other than Russia, Iran, and Turkey. I'll call them and refer to them as the big three, if you don't mind. But with them, other nations are allied together. And with... Russia and Iran chiefly at the helm, they launch this attack against Israel. Now, I want to, and we're not going to take the time in the interest of time, but I want to draw your attention to a very specific detail within the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, and it's found in verse 13, where we're told by their ancient name, Sheba and Dedan, that Saudi Arabia and Tarshish and the young lions thereof will protest this allied attack against Israel. So kind of keep that in your hip pocket for now. I want to come back to that. But it is very specific concerning the role of modern day Saudi Arabia. And it implies that at the time of this attack, somehow, who knew that Saudi Arabia and Israel would have uh, some sort of an alliance together and good foreign relations uh, together. Saudi Arabia and Israel. So that's in verse 13. Let me just say it this way. Um, five years ago, really, I would say even three years ago, I could not stand up here and talk about the detail of verse 13 in the present tense as I can today. Because now as we speak in real time, verse 13 is coming to pass exactly as we were told by the prophet Ezekiel some 2,500 plus years ago. So that's the second prophecy. The third prophecy is in Zechariah 12 and specifically verses 1 through 3, which is a prophecy about how at this time, Jerusalem, God himself, will make Jerusalem the intoxicating obsession of the entire world. And even more specifically, the obsession with Jerusalem will be as it relates to dividing Jerusalem under the banner of what we know today as the so-called two-state solution with Jews and Palestinians, so-called, living side by side together in, quote, peace and security, which brings into play another very astonishing prophecy found in the Apostle Paul's first epistle to the church in Thessalonica, chapter 5, verse 3, where he says that while they are saying those two words, Specifically, peace and security or peace and safety, as some of your translations render it. That's the same Greek word translated in Greek. It's asphalia, which can be translated security or safety, really synonymous in terms. So the Apostle Paul says that while at the time, during the time when they're saying very specifically those two exact words, peace and security, sudden destruction will come upon them, not us, and they, not us, will not escape. We will. And What's really interesting is he likens, as did the Savior before him, this peace and security being likened to, and the sudden destruction that ensues being likened to a woman travailing in labor. 
Now, why is that so significant? Because these like labor pains come in greater frequency and greater intensity. And Jesus is likening his coming to a baby that's coming because of the birth pains. And so what we see happening now is exactly what we were told would be happening now. And again, I, you'll forgive me, but I really believe that we are witnessing exactly these prophecies beginning to come to pass. And I want to encourage you, especially if you're here today or watching online by some other way and you're very discouraged. I want to encourage you as the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonian church said, encourage one another with these words. With what words? Oh, with these words. The trumpet's going to sound. And we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up and taken out of here in the great escape. It'll happen suddenly. What are you saying, Pastor? Are you suggesting that the rapture happens simultaneously with the sudden destruction that comes down upon them? When they don't escape? Well, I'm careful to not be dogmatic about it, but I'm becoming increasingly convinced that when, not if, the sudden destruction comes down upon them and they will not escape, there's the other side of that. There's the we. We are not the they. Again, I know that's not proper English, <laughs> so don't email me. We are the we who are alive and remain at the time that the sudden destruction comes down upon them. We will escape. They will not escape. We are the we. I know that's deeply profound. <laughs> Here's the point. Be a we. Okay? All right, let's close in prayer. That was the... <laughs> that was the whole point right there. I just made the whole point. Be a we. So what I want to do is um, get into this and talk about this and really, uh, more importantly, talk about what this means to every single one of us here today. I don't think it's possible to overstate the significance of what is happening and what I believe is about to happen in the Middle East. Let's start with this Haaretz article on Wednesday about Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan, President Vladimir Putin of Russia, and Iranian President Hossein Rouhani holding their, now this is their second summit, to discuss Syria's future. Uh, you'll remember that the first time these three leaders met was in Sochi, Russia, and it was last November, and it was the first time in history that these three Ezekiel 38 nations were allied together, exactly as we're told in Ezekiel 38. It should be noted that the situation in Syria is what has brought them together and that all three countries today are in Syria as we speak. And it's very interesting because heretofore, Turkey's been on the other side of the table opposite in opposition to Bashar al-Assad and with him, Russia and Iran. So on Friday, the Jerusalem Post published an article about the fallout from the Turkey-Iran-Russia meeting. And in it, they say that the, quote, Iranian regime media is boasting 
after a successful summit in Turkey with the Turkish, Russian, and Iranian presidents. But Iran was not the only winner at the meeting designed to discuss the future of Syria. Listen, still quoting. Russia and Turkey both feel that they are achieving their goals in Syria at the expense of the U.S. The problem being, according to the Post, is that the U.S. has no clear plan now for Syria while its adversaries appear to have one. The recent summit shows how far things have come in a year and a half as the U.S. has been increasingly cut off from an avenue to playing a role in these discussions. There doesn't seem to be a path back for Washington, and that means the outcome of the recent summit will have consequences for U.S. policy. It also means U.S. allies such as, listen, Saudi Arabia and Israel may have less say in the future of Syria. Listen, this comports, I, I want you to think through what I'm about to say. This comports, and maybe better said, fits with the scenario that we have in Scripture, which in it, conspicuously absent, is the once most powerful nation in the world, the United States of America. Now, I understand that there are those who would disagree, and my posture is to disagree, uh, to agree to disagree agreeably, but I cannot find the United States of America present in the pages of Bible prophecy. Certainly, as of now, it would stand to reason that the United States of America it does not have a pronounced present presence in the Middle East. So this fits. And it's beginning now to take shape. Uh, who's in control over there? It's not the U.S. Eight years of one Barack Hussein Obama basically sealed the fate of the United States being the most powerful player in the Middle East, particularly in Syria. Who's in control now? It's not Bashar al-Assad, it's Vladimir Putin, and with him, Iran, and with them, Turkey. And this is exactly what we were told it would be. The United States, and some believe, and stay with me on this, some believe that in verse 13, where we're told that Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish and the young lions thereof, some believe and suggest, and again, we cannot be dogmatic about this, but it does fit. It does comport with the absence of the United States because some believe that Tarshish is the UK, and the young lions are the U.S. And verse 13, again, very specific and very detailed, states that it will be Saudi Arabia, the U.K. and the U.S., if that's the case, will only protest this allied attack from the north vis-a-vis -vis Syria, which is why I truly believe that Isaiah 17.1 concerning Damascus, Syria is the catalyst for the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38. Now, why is that important? Because we're beginning to see now that Isaiah 17 concerning Damascus, Syria is about to be fulfilled. And you have to understand that it will happen very quickly. It almost has to. So you have this subsequent prophecy, Isaiah 17 being fulfilled first, and then it would seem logical that immediately there would be this invasion from Syria into Israel. And that's Ezekiel 38. 
And then you bring into play prophecies like Zechariah 12 concerning Jerusalem. And I'll add to it Daniel 9.27, which is actually going to be another topic for another time. I'll just give you kind of a snapshot of what Daniel 9.27 is about. It's a prophecy about the Antichrist by force enforcing a peace agreement for seven years. And many believe, present company included, that this will commence the seven-year tribulation. And, of course, the rapture of the church must happen, must happen, it has to happen, before... We're dogmatic about that. It has to happen before the seven-year tribulation. Now, Daniel 9.27 also goes on to describe how that at the midpoint, at the three-and-a-half-year mark, the Antichrist in the newly rebuilt temple, which I believe is part of the deal, uh, he will set himself up as God and demand to be worshipped. And it will be at that juncture that the Jewish people will realize that this is not their Messiah as they had thought. This is the Antichrist. This is the anti-Messiah. And then they will flee Jerusalem. I believe they will go to Petra in modern day Jordan, where for the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation, God will protect them. And then at the end of the seven year tribulation, they will call upon him. And as Paul writing to the Romans says, the whole house of Israel will be saved. And by by the way, that is the purpose of the tribulation. It's for the salvation of the Jewish nation. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's. And it's Daniel's 70th week, not half a week, not Daniel's three and a half days, no. It's the time of Jacob's, a.k.a. Israel's trouble. And that's the whole purpose of of the tribulation is to bring to salvation the entire Jewish nation. And it's been said that at the rapture, Jesus comes for us. And at the second coming, Jesus comes with us, ten thousands by his side. Well, that was... Um, kind of prophecy 101 right there, just in a, in a nutshell, I guess you might say. But that's where everything is headed. And uh, maybe again, it's a, another topic for another time. But I want to talk about uh, President Trump, who is the quintessential art of the deal maker, and in concert with being the quintessential deal maker in his quest for the ultimate deal, quote unquote, he's also the ultimate builder. Uh, I have a, an article that uh, I don't, I'm not going to uh, take the time today, but uh, the, the rabbis in Israel believe that Donald Trump is going to be the one who builds the third temple. Oh, pastor, you're, uh, you're really, uh, are you saying that Donald Trump is the Antichrist? No. He doesn't have to be. And here's how I get there. In Daniel 9, 27, again, I had no intention of going this far into it, but maybe I needed to. So just indulge me a little bit longer. So Daniel 9.27 says that the deal is already there. It just has to be enforced. It's the Antichrist who enforces this deal, which is presumably already in place, but has never been enforced. So he, by force, with many, enforces this existing seven-year peace agreement. And that's when the seven-year tribulation begins. So, we'll see. Uh, by the way, one, one more thing. <laughs> I didn't already say one more thing, right? So if I did, this is one more, one more thing. Okay. Um, and again, uh, think through this with me, but don't you think that by Trump 
uh, giving Netanyahu a much needed political boost by expediting the declaration and even the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem for the 70 year anniversary of the birth, rebirth of the Jewish nation on May 14th, 1948, May 14th, 2018. Don't think for a second that Trump isn't going to use that as leverage. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, I truly believe that he's got Netanyahu eating out of the palm of his hand. Because see, now Netanyahu is beholding to Trump. Because Trump basically saved him from political disaster. And so he's got now Netanyahu eating out of the palm of his hand. Now, let's go to the other side of the table with the so-called Palestinians. You've got Mahmoud Abbas, who is rumored to be in very poor health. Some suggest that his days are numbered. Now, if he's out of the, out of the picture, that is, again, another game changer, because then who comes in on the heels of uh, Mahmoud Abbas on the Palestinian side of the table? Well, uh, I hope you know that Trump cut off the money supply to the so-called Palestinians and hit them right where it hurts. So he's bringing them to the table in a different way. Because again, keep in mind, his quest is for the ultimate deal. He said as much. Those are his words, by the way, the ultimate deal. The ultimate deal from the art of the deal is to bring, as nobody's been able to heretofore, the Jews and the Palestinians together and have a peace agreement. That's the ultimate deal for him. So he'll stop at nothing and do everything in order to accomplish it. So how does he do it? Oh, he woos Netanyahu on this side of the table in that way. And he brings, I guess for lack of a better word, even forces the Palestinians by cutting off the money uh, to the table if they want the money. <laughs> so now he's got them talking. And again, I think even eating out of the palm of his hand, so to speak. So then what happens possibly, and this is all speculation, please. Again, I'm very uh, careful to say that I'm not dogmatic in any way about this, but uh, it does seem that at some point a deal will be reached per specifically the prophecy in Zechariah 12. Because they're going to try to divide Jerusalem and God says, if you try to cut up Jerusalem, the city, by the way, that God literally has put his name of ownership on, and if you try to cut it into pieces, I will cut you into pieces. You try to divide Jerusalem, and I will divide you. I've said it before. Maybe it's worth saying again. Um, I wonder if this isn't the reason why the United States of America is more divided than it has ever been in the history of this country. Is not the United States of America and has not America been the prominent player in trying to divide Jerusalem? I'm not just talking about this president or even the last president. I'm talking about all previous presidents. America has been at the forefront in trying to get Israel to give away land and to divide Jerusalem, all under the banner of the so-called Palestinian state. And I know that you know uh, how I see this two-state solution. It's Hitler's final solution repackaged. Because they don't want a, a uh, state with Israel. They don't want to live side by side with Israel. They want the destruction of Israel. And that's exactly what the final solution was. It was the annihilation and the destruction of the Jewish people. 
Well, let's move forward here. Newsweek had echoed this article on Tuesday about how Russia, Turkey, and Iran are planning serious future without the U.S., noting that the U.S. and other Western countries were conspicuously absent from the meeting. I'm actually quoting the article. The article goes on to say how that consensus between the three regional superpowers, speaking of Iran, Russia, and Turkey, also works to highlight how, get this, irrelevant, irrelevant, <laughs> let me add, inconsequential U.S. policy toward the region has become. What's really interesting is that on the heels of said meeting, Trump made the stunning announcement that he wants to withdraw the U.S. from Syria. Did you hear about this just this last week? According to this Times of Israel report, a phone call Wednesday between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and U.S. President Donald Trump grew tense over Israeli objections to U.S. plans to leave Syria, U.S. administration officials said Wednesday, adding that Trump wants to pull out all troops within, interesting, six months. Wait a minute. I thought that Trump didn't like to let anyone know what he was thinking and certainly not to uh, establish a timeline. You'll forgive me for saying this, but that sounds kind of Obama-esque. Right? Am I right? That's uh, very peculiar to me that he would suddenly and I use that word for a reason, that he would suddenly and stunningly say that he wants to withdraw all U.S. troops out of Syria and that he wants to do it within six months? The Times goes on to say that this was to the dismay of the country's main, speaking of Israel, security agencies and allies. What's even more interesting is that according to the Times, and I quote, please listen, this is unbelievable. Trump has asked Saudi Arabia, which is keenly interested in keeping Iran out of Syria, to contribute four billion with a B dollars toward reconstruction and stabilization efforts that the U.S. no longer plans to undertake in Syria. He came away, speaking of Trump, from a phone call Monday with King Salman confident that the king will agree to give the money Two U.S. officials briefed on the conversation told the Associated Press. Doubtless you've heard the expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Well, this is certainly the case with Saudi Arabia, who, by the way, is terrified, and I mean terrified, of Iran, and rightfully so. See, in Saudi Arabia, they are Sunni Muslims. In Iran, they are Shiite Muslims. And in Saudi Arabia, it is home to the two holy sites. Notice I didn't say the two most holy sites. No, no, no. The two only, according to Islam, the two only holy sites, Mecca and Medina. Well, you say, well, wait a minute, what about the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem? That is not a holy site for Islam. Oh, but they say it is. I know they say it is. I know the whole story behind what they suggest or insinuate happened at that location, but it's false. Like the religion of Islam is false. Like Allah is a false god. And like Muhammad is a false prophet. And Islam a false religion. It is false. 
Do you know that in the Quran, you will not find even one time, one time, the mention of Jerusalem. You will not find it. Oh, they try, say, well, you know, it's the original Arabic is, a, you know, very complex language. <laughs> And so they say, well, it's a, it's a reference to the, the faraway place. Wow, really? Really? Jerusalem is the city of all of the cities in the world that God chose to put his name of ownership on. And Saudi Arabia now is terrified of Iran and so the enemy of my enemy is my friend and so now they're running to Israel who is also afraid of Iran and so they're coming together and they're becoming friendly together and they are allies together. Now listen to this. On Tuesday, Fox News published a report about how Saudi Arabia's crown prince slammed Obama's Iran nuclear deal and backed Israel's right to exist. <laughs> Hello? Did, listen, it, did you just hear that? Let me, let me just say it again. Maybe I didn't read it very well. I don't know. Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, slammed Obama's Iran nuclear deal <laughs> and backed Israel's right to exist. Are you kidding me? Are you, you know, you'll forgive the silliness with which I illustrate this, but it's almost like these guys get up in the morning and they go, okay, Ezekiel 38, verse 13. Oh, yeah, we need to, we need to uh, get with the program here. It's right here. So that's what we're supposed to do. Okay, so. <laughs> Again, you'll forgive the, the silly. It gets better, by the way. Let me uh, continue quoting. Uh, bin Salman was also quoted as saying, get this, quote, uh, Hitler <laughs> didn't do what the supreme leader of Iran is trying to do. Hitler tried to conquer Europe. This is bad, but the supreme leader, speaking of the Ayatollah Khamenei, is trying to conquer the world. He is the Hitler of the Middle East. I, I'm going to get my asthma here in a moment, but I, it gets better even. <laughs> Quoting, he believes he owns the world. They are both evil guys. In the 1920s and 1930s, no one saw Hitler as a danger. Still quoting, listen, only a few people until it happened. Those three words, until it happened, but it was too late. Oh, would to God that people would see what is happening and that it would not be until it happened before they see it. Because if it's not until it happened, then it's going to be too late. Al Arabiya published a report about the father of the prince, Saudi Arabia's King Salman, having a telephone conversation on Monday evening with U.S. President Donald Trump in which he discussed regional updates. The king expressed his thanks and appreciation to Trump for the way in which the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, his son, the heir apparent, was received during his US tour and the, quote, fruitful meetings and the signing of important agreements that benefit the two friendly countries. 
Al Arabiya goes on to report that King Salman stressed on the international effort needed to move forward the Middle East peace process. <laughs> as well as stressing on the kingdom's steadfast positions on the Palestinian cause and the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people and the establishment of an independent state with Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem as its capital. Zechariah 12. Do you see the intersect? Do you see the interconnect? Isaiah 17, Syria, Ezekiel 38, Russia, Iran, Zechariah 12, Israel, Jerusalem. The king also stressed the need to find a solution to the Syrian crisis that fulfills the aspirations of the Syrian people. By the way, everything that we've seen up to this point happened just this last week. We're talking six days, six days since Resurrection Sunday. Six days. Look at how much has happened. And then... All of this happened prior to the breaking news last night, early this morning in Hawaii, about this chemical weapon attack near Damascus on a hospital, no less. If you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, you wince. That's if you're able to even view the images. They are so horrific. I can't. I can't see little babies. Especially after I held my dying daughter in my arms before she died. I cannot see a baby like that. And these are my people. These are Arabs. The estimates vary. According to Haaretz, they're estimating that 80 men, women, and children were killed. A medical relief organization and rescue workers reported this, and Washington said it would demand an immediate international response if the reports were confirmed. I think the president tweeted, and I was just checking my Twitter uh, feed, during worship, you'll forgive me for doing that, <laughs> but um, I think one of the tweets from uh, Trump was that there would, quote, be a price to pay, a price to pay. Um, again, I don't know if it's possible, and I don't want to come off hyper-sensational here, but this is really significant. I don't think it's possible to overstate the significance of this development just in the last, let's call it 12 hours. 12 hours. And especially when you consider the escalation of the situation supremely in Syria in just the last six days. And isn't the timing a little suspect? Is it just me or on the heels of Trump's announcement that we're going to withdraw from? And, and please, I hope you know that this uh, gas is significantly more powerful than the sarin gas that was used prior. Now, why is that significant? Because... Uh, it's believed that this is the same kind of nerve gas that uh, the Russians, the former Soviet Union, has been using uh, all along. In other words, this has Russia's fingerprints all over it. And again, is it just me or is Vladimir Putin very emboldened right now? I mean... I hesitate to say it this way, but I don't know how else to say it. 
What we're seeing is the likes of which we have never seen before. Even five years ago, when we were doing these prophecy updates, and we've been doing them for 12 years now, I started doing them in 2006, when I really sensed that the Lord was impressing upon my heart to start teaching Bible prophecy, because we were entering into a period of human history that would be the likes of which we had never seen before, nor would we ever see again. That was 12 years ago. So even five years ago, when I was talking about Ezekiel 38 and Isaiah 17 and Zechariah 12, I was talking about it in a future tense. But now I stand before you today, as is my privilege to do every week, and I'm finding myself talking about this in the present tense. It's not that it's going to happen. It seems that it's already beginning to happen. Can I say it that way? It's beginning to happen. Now, here's where I'm going with this. I would suggest that it's just a matter of time before someone does something and pushes the world past the proverbial point of no return. And here's the thing. That something may have actually just happened. Again, I might be accused of being uh, too hyper sensational here, but I'm just going to say it as candidly and as calmly as I possibly can. This is, I believe, very potentially that which will push the world past the point of no return. I mean, just think about it logically. Can you see the headlines tomorrow morning reading Russia and Iran have changed a heart and leave Syria? Do you think that's going to happen? No. You know, the one thing about, and I, I know I'm saying it again this week, and I've been saying it a lot in recent weeks, but you know the thing about birth pains, right? Once they start, you don't put them on pause. Again, you'll forgive the silliness of the illustration, but can you imagine the doctor coming in and saying, hey, you know what, I've got a staff meeting, and then I promised my staff I was going to take them to lunch afterwards, so you just need to hold off until I get back, and then we'll resume with the birth pains? No. <laughs> That baby's coming. And this is exactly what we see now. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. The implications of this are of paramount importance for every single one of us, whether Christians or not. And if you'll hear me out, I want to talk about that in the remainder of our time together today. But I want to say one more thing. Um, we're talking hours now. Before I got here this morning, I'm watching Fox News, and uh, they were talking about how that just in the last two hours, so I'm going to say it was probably between uh, maybe 6 and 8 a.m. or 5 and 7 a.m., uh, the Trump administration is already discussing uh, what to do about this. Uh, last time this happened, uh, we launched Tomahawk missiles. Now, keep in mind, uh, we might launch Tomahawk missiles into Syria, but it's not between us and Syria. It's between us and Russia and Iran. You understand that, right? And by the way, uh, Iran is uh, threatening the United States of America concerning this uh, infamous nuclear deal. Because what has Trump said? We either fix it or nix it. Well, this is unfixable, so that means it's nixable, and they know it. And that's what's at stake here. And then the appointment of John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, <laughs> So it's like, that's in your face. That's in your face. These guys, especially John Bolton. 
not a Christian, Pompeo, a Christian who believes in the rapture. He's my friend. <laughs> and th these guys are staunchly pro-Israel and they are as pro-Israel as they are anti-Iran. And don't you find that timing a little bit conspicuous too? Because that appointment, that announcement is what, less than two weeks old now? And then here's Russia and Iran now responding, perhaps better said, reacting exactly as we were told they would. So what happens now? Well, I really believe we're going to see something happen in the next few days, maybe even in just a matter of hours. Because there seems to be what I see as this unstoppable momentum. You know how when something gains momentum, it's either harder or worse yet, impossible to stop by virtue of the increased momentum. You know, the faster the car's going, the, the longer the distance is before you can come to a complete stop by sure virtue of the momentum. And so too is this true with the momentum of all of these geopolitical developments that are taking place. Let me talk about first those of us who are Christians. I want you to think about this. None of these prophecies, and we've talked about actually five of them, Isaiah 17, Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 12, Daniel 9, 27, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. None of these prophecies need to happen before the rapture happens. Let me say the same thing again in a different way. They don't need to happen before the rapture happens. They just need to begin, keyword, to happen before the rapture happens. Now I say to you, I ask you, in all honesty, are they beginning to happen? Jesus said, Luke 21, 28, I, I know you're familiar with this, at least I hope you are. Jesus said something very profound, directed at those of us who know the Lord and are longing for the return of the Lord. He said, when you see these things, keyword, begin, begin to come to pass, here's what you do. Look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. If you're discouraged and you're longing for the Lord to come back, I want to encourage you, the Apostle Paul writing to the Thessalonians in the context of the rapture in chapter 4 where he says that the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain. He goes on and he says this, he says, therefore encourage one another with these words. I talk to a lot of people and one of the things that I'm uh, hearing is this weariness. <laughs> this discouragement. And like me, we, we long for, we, we ache for the Lord's return. The Lord cannot come back and rapture us out of here soon enough. I want to encourage you that the Lord's return draws nigh. No, we don't know the day or the hour. We cannot know, but here's what we can know. It's very soon. Jesus said, Behold, I come at an hour you expect not. I've always uh, mu mused over that because if I'm understanding it correctly, it's as if Jesus is saying, um, I'm going to come at an hour that you don't think I'm going to come. 
So in other words, here, here's the way my brain is wired, and I know they have clinical terms for the way my way, brain is wired, but here's how, in my way of thinking how I think about that. Okay, so uh, I really don't think, I mean, I know it's possible, but between the hour of 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock this afternoon, I'm really not expecting, I mean, it'd be great, you know, praise the Lord, if the rapture were to happen, but I'm not expecting him necessarily to come specifically at that hour between 2 and 3 o'clock this afternoon. And that's what Jesus said. Oh, oh. <laughs> you're not expecting me to come back at that hour? <laughs> that's the hour I could come back. Now, what comes packaged with that is great hope and great encouragement. See, here's how we're supposed to see this. If the Lord could come back at any time, on any day, and at any hour, how then ought we to live? This is what we, we call it the blessed hope. I, I say it's the only hope. And not only is it the only hope, it's the only thing that keeps me sane. And that's not hyperbole. And I know I've shared this before. If it were not for this hope, that the rapture can happen at any time, I would literally go out of my mind. As I see how evil this world is becoming, it's waxing more and more evil, seemingly by the day and even the hour. And I can't take it anymore. And I can't watch these babies in Syria dying anymore. I just can't. I want Jesus to come back. See, and that's what enables me to sleep at night. And that's what enables me to get up in the morning and get through the day. Is knowing that this could be the day. I know it's soon. How soon? Soon. Well, what if it's not for another five years? <sighs> Well, you know what? We're to occupy until he comes, even as we are now doing. And by the way, God will never call or command us to do anything without also enabling us to do that which he's called and commanded us to do. What do you mean? Well, if God has called us and even commanded us to occupy until he comes, being busy about the things of God, he is going to, with that, enable us and empower us to do it. To get through it. If the Lord's return isn't for another five years, I have the promise from God that he will enable me to bear up under all that I will experience and go through all the difficulty, all the hardship until he comes. He will empower me by the power of the Holy Spirit to occupy until he comes, making use of and seizing every opportunity that he presents before me. Well, as Christians, we can look up and lift up our heads because Jesus is at the door. I will even say his hand is on the doorknob. It's that close. Now, let's talk about something else here and Hang in there with me. I need to say this. That some Christians, and certainly those who are not Christians, need to wake up. Well, that's pretty blunt, I know. It's pretty strong. It needs to be. You need to wake up. You're spiritually asleep. You've hit the snooze button on that alarm that has been sounding in your life. I was thinking about Resurrection Sunday and how when they went to the Mount of Olives and they went to the garden and Jesus 
tells the disciples to pray. And he says this, he says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. And what does he find when he comes back, when he goes off and prays and then comes back? He finds him sleeping. What, what's really intriguing to me is that I wonder, talking about Peter specifically, I wonder if had he been praying and watching, would he have denied the Lord? I mean, the Lord knew he would, but is that why? Hmm. I was thinking about Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul, true to form, and we've come to appreciate this about the Apostle Paul in our study through the New Testament. But true to form, he just head on says it like it is in all of its needed sanctified strength. He says this and do this. Understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Why? Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness. Get rid of that. There's no time for that. And put on the armor of light. He says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. There's no time for that. Wake up! Instead, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. It's time to wake up. Maybe this is a word for somebody here today or watching online. This is the wake up call. Maybe the alarm isn't going to go off again. And you won't even be able to hit the snooze button again. If you'll just give me a couple more minutes, and I appreciate very much your patience. I want to take the remainder of our time and talk to those who have never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If you're watching this online, I truly believe that it was no accident that you found this video on your, <laughs> your screen. You, you think, that's strange. Where did, who's this guy? I know I don't, you know. <laughs> There's a reason why you're uh, finding this video, especially at this point. This is the Lord trying to reach you. And maybe you're sitting here today. I make no assumptions. If you're sitting here in this church that is my privilege to pastor and you've never called upon the name of the Lord, I implore you to do so today. To not put off the most important decision of your life for eternal life. This is the most important decision you will ever make. The decision concerning Jesus Christ. See, this is what's going to happen. I was uh, talking to my daughter during one of our morning devotions, and uh, we were talking about how that there's going to be a lot of good people in hell and a lot of very bad people in heaven. And I'll, I'll raise my... I'll be at the front of the line, by the way. Because <laughs> that's not what determines who's going to be in heaven and who's going to be in hell for all eternity, by the way. Contrary to what Pope Francis said, that hell's not for eternity. Or there is no hell, I think it was. No, there, there has to be a hell. If there's no hell, there's no heaven. If there's no heaven, there's no hell. 
we're all going to spend eternity someplace. That's why Jesus came. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish in hell for all eternity, but have everlasting life in heaven with him for all eternity. And by the way, it's not God's will that anyone should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Hell was never prepared for man. Hell was prepared for the devil and his demons. So God never sends anybody to hell. If anybody goes to hell, I like how one said it. Very apropos. If anyone goes to hell, they do so over Christ's dead and resurrected body. God never sends anybody to hell. And that's the gospel, by the way. That's what the Apostle Paul defined it as in his first epistle to the church in Corinth, chapter 15, in verses 1 through 4. He defines the gospel as of first importance, the most important. And it's that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. You know what the word gospel actually, literally, simply means? Good news. Your debt has been paid. You're free to go. Good news. That's what the word gospel means. What debt? Oh, <laughs> you have a penalty to pay. It's the death penalty. But the good news is, is that Jesus Christ paid that penalty for you and instead of you by going to the cross, being crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day. That's the good news. And that is good news. Well, that's the gospel. Now, Here's the childlike, simple explanation of how to respond to the gospel and be saved. Please, please, please do not tune me out. Please listen to me. How do you know that God isn't going to bring somebody into your path this week for such a time as this? So that you can give to everyone that answer of the hope that lies within you and share with them the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ in a very simple way. It's known as the, very simply, the ABCs of salvation. The A is for admit that you're a sinner in need of the Savior. This is repentance, by the way, because repentance simply means to change, to do a 180. You have a, a change of mind, and now God can change your heart. And, and the change is, the repentance is, I have sinned against a perfect and righteous and holy God. I have fallen short of the perfect standard of God's righteousness. And I need the Savior because I have sinned. In Romans 3 verse 10 it says, There is no one righteous, not even one. You know, whenever I do a memorial service, in fact Wednesday we have a memorial service for and celebration for George Kali'i who went home to be with the Lord. I always make sure to say that, yes, you can probably be a good person. And you, and you probably are a good person. And certainly you have a good heart. But here's the problem. It's not good enough. You fall short. All Romans 3.23 have fallen short. As good as you are, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were all born under Adam as sinners. 
which is why we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23, one of my favorites, because it seems to package the bad news with the good news, and it's the bad news first. And there's something to that, by the way. This is what we know to be true about the Ten Commandments. It's very bad news. Because the Ten Commandments show you, you. It's a mirror to show you your true condition. You're a sinner. You've broken all ten of those commandments and then some. I know for me, I've broken some that aren't in the ten. <laughs> and I've sinned. And I've broken God's law. And I'm under the death penalty. And that's the bad news. For the wages of sin is death. The wages. That's what we've earned. That's, that's the payment. That, that's the penalty. It's the death penalty. That's the bad news. First. Now, here's the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul says famously, You are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Could you imagine heaven? If we could do something to get to heaven and then boast about it when we get there, that would not be heaven. I think that's the other place, actually. <laughs> what did you do to get here? Whoa, you should have seen me. Oh my goodness. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You will be saved. Wow, that's, that's too simple. I know. That's the problem, isn't it? Have we not complicated the gospel? Have we not added to the simplicity, the childlike simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You must do this, you must do that, you must do this, you must do that. No. Come just as you are. That's the B. Here's the C, lastly. The C is for call upon the name of of the Lord, or if you prefer, again, Romans 10, 9 and 10, confess with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And lastly, I like to say that this is how you seal the deal. Romans 10, 13. All, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Can I say this lastly? <laughs> All who call will be a we. Kind of, it's got a little ring to it, doesn't it? And I came up with that all by myself. Well, actually, the Holy Spirit, I'm sure. But all who call will be a we. Be a we. So now you can tell people, what, you, what would the pastor talk about at church today? Oh, he talked about that I need to be a we. <laughs> Why don't you all stand and we'll all uh, pray and close in prayer. And again, thank you so much for your patience. Father in heaven, I, <laughs> I thank you for the grace from your people and their patience as well. But more importantly, Lord, I, I thank you so much for Bible prophecy because you've told us what's going to happen before it happens so that 
when it begins to happen, believers will look up and non-believers will believe. Lord, as we look around at the world, and especially what's happening in Syria and in the Middle East today, it's exactly as you said it would be. And Lord, you didn't just include prophecy in the Bible so that we would know. You included prophecy in the Bible so that we would believe and be ready. So Lord, I would just pray and ask for anyone here in this church or watching online that has never called upon you that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would not put it off even one more day, let alone one more hour. Thank you, Lord. And lastly, for believers, Lord, would you, as only you can, would you just encourage our hearts? And would you, in so doing, enable us to encourage one another? We need encouragement, Lord. Lord, we want to finish well. We want to run the race, and we know, like the Apostle Paul said, that what awaits us, all of us who are longing for your appearing, is a crown of righteousness. Lord, we can't wait, not for the crown, but to cast that crown at your feet before your throne. Lord, come quickly. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen.